Welcome to the special Liquid Margins. It's number 28, and it's Social Annotation Showcase, a look back at Liquid Margins. So we're kind of jumping on that gravy train of um, looking back at the year, except we're looking back to 2020 because it's all like one big year. And also because we started Liquid Margins in 2020. And so we wanted to have a chance to talk about the entire um, oeuvre, right? Today's guests are Franny French. I don't know if you've heard of her. Uh, she's the digital marketing specialist at Hypothesis. She's wearing a tie today. I'm not going to a wedding later. Nate and I didn't plan to wear ties, by the way, FYI. Uh, Nate Angel is also here with us. He's the director of marketing at Hypothesis. And like I said, we have Michael DeRoberts, and um, he's going to be in the chat. And Michael agrees with what I just said. Thank you, Michael. Um, all the episodes um, that we're going to be talking about today, um, we, we will be going across the entire 27 episodes, but we're not going to have time to um, highlight clips from all of them, um, but just from some, um, but not because we don't love all the other ones. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nate. Thank you. I was expecting you to say one more thing there. So yeah, as Franny suggested, um, you know, we've had uh, over the course since we started Liquid Margins back in 2020, spring of 2020, if I'm not mistaken, we uh, have done 27 episodes. This is the 28th episode of Liquid Margins. And um, we, as in, prepar in preparation for the show, Franny and I went back and looked at them all, believe it or not. And um, oh my gosh, there's just so much great stuff in every single one that it was impossible to choose, you know, just a few clips in the time that we have here today, a few to highlight. So we're actually going to um, walk, take you down through a trip of the memory lane through every episode, um, starting with number one, but we're going to delve into a couple of episodes in a little more depth uh, and, and kind of uh, explore uh, pull out some some highlights from those episodes in particular. But I'll just say, first of all, our huge thanks to all the different presenters and guests who come on Liquid Margins and shared their thinking and their practices, because what a rich trove. Forget social annotation for a second, just like what a rich trove of people talking about their teaching practices, especially during this time uh, of the pandemic, when I think teachers and students were especially challenged. And so, um, you know, our hearts really go out and our thanks to all the people, all the guests who joined, as well as the participants. Um, so there have been so many great folks who've joined Liquid Margins Live uh, to be part of the audience, if you will, and uh, more here today. So really thankful to, to everyone who, who's participated so far. So yeah, and actually, I, I just sorry. second what you said, sorry to interject. There's gonna be a lot of that going on here, but. I just want to second what you said, and um, I feel a little remiss that I did not say that as well. Um, and it's just been a real pleasure to be around so many um, thoughtful and educated and um, smart people, you know, and it can be a little intimidating. And not that I don't think that I'm smart, but, you know, sometimes I just high hole because things are going over my head a little bit. <laughs> well, you know what, Fanny, you are smart and God dang it, people like you as well, I so. I love that. <laughs> so we're gonna keep it kind of light today with our normal banter uh, that some of you may have experienced at our I Annotate social hours. At any rate, so as not to, not to um, uh, delay the, the trip down memory lane any farther. So there, like I said before, there's 27 episodes and each one is, you know, between 45 minutes and an hour. So that's, you know, um, more than 20 hours of, of watching. So as Alex suggested in the chat, if you're going to binge watch Liquid Margins over the holidays, uh, which would be a great thing to do, I think, uh, you're going to be spending over 20 hours doing it, just so you know. Um, so I wanted to just highlight a little bit from Liquid Margins 1, our first episode, first of all, because it was a great episode where um, both Kyle and Michael came on. And these are two folks that are super experienced, not just in working with hypothesis and bringing social annotation to their schools, but in just in using educational technology and different pedagogies in general. And they, they just speak really thoughtfully and, and, and really intelligently about those processes. And um, 
when you grab the slides, there's links to every episode record up here, you know, where it says liquid margins and the episode number. Um, and so you can, you can dive in and see some of the other resources that were behind each episode. In this case, there was a great blog post about um, how to, how to pilot anything really um, in, a, in a thoughtful way. Um, and so, but the clip that I wanted to play, which I'm just about to do, um, is about something else. Um, it's about liquid margins itself. And so let's, uh, let's pause for a minute and hear what the clip has to say. And we coming up with a name for something is one of the hardest things that uh, that you can do. And so um, we went through a long process of trying to figure out what to call the show. And here's a few of the um, names that didn't quite make the grade. Um, I was um, I was pretty, uh, pretty psyched for a couple of them. I, I when margins last on the dooryard bloomed, I thought was a pretty good title, um, or maybe even puff the magic margin. Um, I'm actually decided that I'm pretty much going to be known now as the Sheriff of Nottingham, um, which isn't really a great show name, but I thought it would be a, a cool title. But at any rate, none of these, none of these names for the show made the cut. Um, and so we ended up with, ta-da, you are at episode one of Liquid Margins. And that and that's how it all kicked off, right? Um, you know, it could, the show could have been called Noddy McNoteface. <laughs> or border hedge, as we like to say, but no. Border hedge, or it's not butter, it's margin. <laughs> <laughs> another, another great one. There were a lot of great name ideas, but we ended up with liquid margins, and 28 episodes later, uh, here we are. And so, um, <clears throat> actually, I, I ended up, it seems odd like we're going to do this for each episode. I ended up picking a clip from episode number two as well, um, and, and this was, you know, this was when we were just first getting started with the show. And the second episode just also blew our minds because it was just such great conversation about um, how composition teachers use, uh, use social annotation in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just say that um, uh, this was a really interesting episode. It actually had three guests. One of them doesn't appear on camera, and that's why they're not in the in the thumbnail, and they won't be on camera. But it's actually it, it was Chris Gilliard that I picked for the clip. And one of the things as I was watching through the shows is each episode is packed with all sorts of great ideas about how to use social annotation and you know like really specific teaching practices both within certain disciplines and across disciplines. Um, and this episode, of course, is packed with all of that. But I was also looking for when people stepped away from the details and thought a little bit more like big picture about what this all means. And I think Chris's quote here um, pulls out something that I thought was interesting that came up in many episodes. And that's this idea of people have an anxiety that when there are annotations in a reading that... Um, that that will somehow infect people's first reading of something and that it that it's like it's unfortunate that people don't read without other voices in the margin if you will and so let's hear what chris has to say about that i'm not going to blow up the screen because he's not on camera um but uh i i, I really liked the way that he talked about that particular topic there is no such thing as a blank slate you know i think that when we um, encourage students to buy into some of these myths. Um, you know, it, they're intensely problematic for lots of reasons, um, but, but mostly that notion that it somehow spoiled a, a text to know what someone else thinks about it um, rather than enriches it, you know? Um, I, I mean, this is not like a, a way of thinking that I share. Um, and in fact, again, like I think, so uh, to, to draw another example, if you're in a lit class and you're reading, you know, saw Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, um, uh, what I used to do when I taught lit is you give like them also some criticism of that work, right? Well, again, like I, I'm not familiar with anyone saying, well, now that you read that criticism, right, you, the, the novel spoiled. I mean that like, so um, I think I understand where those notions are coming from, but I think they're really mistaken. And I think that's, that's a theme that we saw come up, you know, we kind of asked a lot of guests about that, about, you know, when, when students come to a text and there's already voices in the margins, you know, how does that help or hinder their reading and their thinking about the text? And that's, it's an interesting theme to just explore throughout, throughout the shows and, and 
throughout the whole practice of social annotation. So we don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to press on. Um, but in each one of these episodes, in this case, I didn't pick out a clip. This was a fantastic episode as well, focused on the discipline of history. Real, two really smart historians talking about how they use social annotation. Um, but I will just say that in general, like even if history isn't your discipline, watching the history episode can be really valuable and interesting. And that's I'll say that for all the episodes because people really um, thought about things in ways that cross disciplines in every case. So if you're a historian, this episode is a must see. If you're not a historian, it's probably gonna be packed with really valuable things as well. And the same thing is true about this next episode, episode four about science. Um, that also had a couple of guests, um, one who didn't appear on camera, and that's why they're, they're, they're only one person in the, in the thumbnail. But uh, in the science practice, they um, actually opened up one of the themes that I want to explore in a later clip, which is about how reading itself is such a social act. Um, and so we'll come back to that when we get to the next clip. We did this special episode on um, social annotation in the Sakai learning platform which is one of my old favorites and, and was a really uh, valuable uh, kind of exploration of some of the technical details, but then some of the teaching practices associated with that as well. Then in episode six, um, this was a really great episode. Uh, I say that about everyone, don't I? <laughs> but in this episode, two instructional designers talked about their practices working with faculty in order to kind of um, you know, evangelize for the adoption of both really good pedagogical practices and social annotation. And um, oh my gosh, the, the energy and the, the conversation in this episode are just stellar. Um, uh, I love this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking up a little bit. Franny knows how it is. I get kind of emotional, but um, this one almost brought a tear to my eye. But what a great episode. So sort of like the last episode, number six was about engaging with teachers. This one is about engaging with students. And again, really great um, thoughts and voices from Danielle and Michelle here, um, both. Um, and so I highly recommend that episode as well. So uh, we now come to the last clip that I picked, um, which um, is from this really fantastic episode on math. Um, with, uh, with Matthew Salamone. And <clears throat> this is just an amazing episode, partially because it, it really gets into the intricacies of how social annotation works with math, which is not necessarily a thing that most people, um, you know, jump to as their first idea of what social annotation, like the discipline that social annotation would be most comfortable with, right? People often think of humanities social sciences, English composition, all those things. Um, so Matt, Matt talks about that quite a bit, but what's even, what's even more powerful to me is the way that Matthew talks about um, math as a practice and, and our kind of our human relationship to math and math pedagogy in general. So I wanna play this little clip from him. It's a little bit longer, but um, I think it, it touches on a lot of the themes that he brings out in the episode as a whole, and uh, it's really powerful. So let's listen to what Matt has to say. Because what the practice of mathematics looks like, not just at the teaching and learning level, but at the professional sort of research mathematics level, is that mathematics is an inherently social enterprise. Um, how we figure out whether a mathematical idea is even true in the first place is we don't submit it to some all-knowing, all-seeing oracle in the sky somewhere, right? Is we submit it to one another and we engage in a conversation and we assess, you know, the success of a new argument or even the success of a very definition um, in community with one another. Um, and that's what it looks like to sort of practice mathematics. I think one of the things that's telling about math um, is that other disciplines get different verbs out in front of them. We can practice an art, we can conduct a science experiment, we can investigate a question in social science. Um, but what is the thing that gets attached to math? What's the verb that gets attached to math? We do math. And the reason that we do math is that it can be done and we can then do something else with the rest of our day, right? Just the, the choices of words that we use there. Um, and it sort of glosses right over the fact that we don't do math as individuals most of the time. In math classes, that's what it looks like. Um, in the field of math, we are sort of plagued with this myth of individual genius, right? We celebrate these individuals who have made contributions to our field who are almost invariably young, white, and male. Um, 
And so there's this, this folklore that builds up around math, that that's what doing math for the sake of having it done looks like, is, is one person that's brilliant, um, usually a white guy, sitting in front of a piece of paper almost monastically and sort of elucidating it all on paper. But that's not what real math looks like. Um, it's not what it looks like for professional research mathematicians. It shouldn't be what it looks like for first graders, you know, learning basic facts in their classroom. Um, because what the practice of math. Sorry, I sort of flubbed up at the end there, stopping that. But um, so this is this is a theme that that math explores really powerfully with with math, but that we saw people surface across all the disciplines, and that's that. Every practice is inherently social. Every academic practice, every research practice, the act of reading itself, even if you're doing it all alone in a room, you're always in a social context. You know, the world around you, things that people have said about those books, as Chris Gilliard said, you know, the criticism that you might have read or the fact that someone suggested it to you. And so um, uh, I really like the way that Matt applied that to math here, but it's something that just stretches across all the different all the different disciplines in a really powerful way. And so, if you do binge watch all the episodes, I I recommend that you keep an eye out for people touching on that issue. Um, for instance, in the sciences too, about how the sciences are inherently social and not some sort of you know you know practice that someone just does all by themselves in a monastery like the one I'm in here right now. Yeah, for any unmuted, whoa. Yeah, I wanted to say that, um, yeah, it is, it, um, all learning is collaborative and also the arts are collaborative too. Um, and I, something that Chris said, or that point that you're pointing out that Chris Gilliard said earlier, um, it makes me think of when um, I meet a writer and they say, well, I don't read anybody else because I don't want them to influence my writing. And it's like all writing is influenced, all art is influenced by other art. So just made me think of that. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I think that's just something that that annotation helps us surface, right, is we, we like uh, Matt talked about the folklore of the, you know, the, the lonely white male mathematician working in front of the blank piece of paper. Same thing with the idea of a book, like the lonely reader in, in front of the, their, you know, white, black and white book. That's not, that's not how actually most reading takes place. And even when it does, your own, you know, your own engagement with the reading is already a social activity. So we don't, we, again, we could talk about that all day, but we, we need to press on. Um, <clears throat> oops, I went backwards instead of forwards. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I'm just about to hand the baton over to Franny because she picked out selections from the second half of all the episodes. Um, but just to say a couple of quick things, you know, we had folks who uh, spoke specifically about using social annotation with high school students as opposed to uh, college students. Fantastic stuff there, really powerful, um, and proof that you can you can use social annotation with really any any age group. In fact, I've heard of people doing social annotation, you know, all the way down in kindergarten and preschool. Uh, often they won't be digital then; it will be analog. You know, they'll be using crayons and markers and stickers and stuff, but they're still reading together on the page, and that's what's important. Um, world language is such a powerful use case uh, that we talked about in episode ten, right? Where not only can you annotate a document in any language, but you can also make your annotations in any language. And so um, there's just such powerful use cases for for um, world language study with social annotation. Yeah, no show about liquid margins would be complete without a shout out to Remy Clear, our good friend and the inaugural scholar of residence um, at Hypothesis. He's done so much great work, not just here, but also for annotation in general, a great scholar and thinker about, about annotation. And, um, you know, if you don't know Remy and his work already, uh, you should, because he's, he's an incredibly, incredibly accomplished and powerful voice. Uh, in Liquid Margins 12, I actually did pick out a clip here. We don't have enough time to delve into it right now. Maybe at the end, of, we can come back to it. This is a fantastic um, episode on uh, kind of thinking about how students can be made successful or can be enabled to be successful um, with the help of social annotation at a college that's near and dear to my heart as a Colorado and Colorado College. Some really great, some really great uh, thoughts there. Um, and then um, one of my all-time favorites that uh, I didn't pick a clip from because just the whole episode is fantastic um, is this idea of, you know, not even focused on social annotation, but the idea of how do we build 
you know, equitable and hospitable learning environments? And how do we deliver equitable and hospitable learning experiences for everyone and for anyone? And so we had three really thoughtful thinkers here with Maha, Mia and, um, and Autumn uh, kind of addressing that, which is, is core to their work. That's a really great episode and it's worth watching in, in full. Uh, I couldn't even pull out a clip from it. So um, that brings us to an end of the, the half of the, the smaller half of the shows that I um, went through and picked pick my favorites from. Uh, so let me open the floor now to my colleague and friend, Franny French, um, and have you lead us through this next bunch of episodes. Great, great. Thank you, Nate. And I'll, I'll just go like that when you're supposed to go to the next slide, because Nate's running the board or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I can't walk into chew, chew gum at the same time. Um, the social annotation and teacher education one, also another great one. And I think it just does a really good job of showing how, um, you know, teachers also like aren't necessarily used to using social annotation in their teaching. So they, they also need to be, to have experience with that. And so it's just great having um, the uh, teacher educators, educating teachers who can then pass down social annotation practices to students who can then share with each other, so. And that's another theme that went through all the episodes, right? I mean, Matt Salamone talked about that in, in teacher education and math too, about how how uh, teachers can, uh, you know, try to help people get over the kind of math anxiety that builds up when they're young, when they're so young. Um, and so he brought that into his practice with teaching teachers, right? Um, and then social annotation, bridging theory and practice. Um, I do have a clip from this one, and there were so many good things. It was it was really hard to isolate, you know, um, clips and ignore the other ones because I knew I wouldn't have time for. But this entire episode is great. So Nate, if you would go ahead and play this clip, thank you. Will do. Okay, uh, I learned about it through a workshop this summer. Um, where Shauna Crossan was there, a, a technology consultant um, at the University of Minnesota. And um, I think maybe Shenron was there and Hong and Bodong, you may have been there too. Um, and I, I remember getting really excited about this idea of hypothesis and social annotation. And I pursued um, getting the integration um, into uh, my Canvas site, um, and I went to this special training um, just for hypothesis and social annotation, which was exciting to me. Um, probably the most exciting thing I learned about online teaching this past summer, and I was excited about it for a couple of reasons. Um, I was going to be teaching, I was developing a course, Dance History, that I had inherited that I was wanting to change up and really think about it. it. It's a writing intensive course. And I really wanted to think about how to teach writing um, in a way that um, students could really pay attention to the texts that they were reading in order to um, learn from the writing strategies of those authors and then uh, incorporate them into their own writing. So that was one thing that was exciting to me. And another was just really focusing on how do you read a, the, one of these university level texts? Uh, it's hard enough to read by yourself. <laughs> and so when you get to read with your, um, with co-students, uh, it's really wonderful um, for the students to share their knowledge with each other. Um, so I wanted to incorporate um, one, this cooperative learning model that I used to use when I taught elementary school. And also I used to teach reading. So I had all this training on comprehension strategies. Um, and so I would include that as, as prompts for students to annotate. So things like using prior knowledge, you know, what's familiar, um, identifying the main idea or the argument, um, asking questions, what's new to you, um, making connections. And then another time we had a, an annotation based on what in this reading sparks your curiosity. So that, that's how I got it, it, excited about all of this. 
You know, and I, I mean, I should have, I just want to add, I should have um, set that up with what Cindy was going to say, but I'll just do it backwards. But I, I love the idea there of connecting reading with writing, but starting with how you read. So teaching someone how to read and the questions that she asks, I think are really instrumental. And in, um, in my own reading that I do outside of work, it's, I can use those questions and I do use those questions. Um, and then I also love the term cooperative learning. So that was a beautiful clip, I thought. Yeah, just going back to that idea that, you know, we're all learning is social, right? And ideally cooperative as opposed to say competitive. <laughs> Yeah. You don't want a competitive, competitive social learning would be a different kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think she, she also brings up some really specific points about how she uses annotation with, with specific readings, which is, is really powerful. Um, and that team at Minnesota has done a lot of really interesting research and, and kind of diving into the, the, you know, the, you know, how social annotation can afford sort of like even more intense uh, learning outcomes than, than other things. So uh, yeah. next slide. Yes, please. Right, and I also really like this one, but I didn't pull a quote from it. I mean, I didn't pull a quote from it, um, but community and composition. So again, um, going back to that idea of community and annotating in, um, community or how annotating leads to a sense of community and how that can help in kind of core core um, English, like foundational English courses. Um, and of course it has Ramey in it, who we love, and also um, people, members of the research team at um, Indiana University who we've been partnering with over the past year and changed to do research into social annotation. So, if you're interested in social annotation research, definitely check this one out if you haven't seen it or give it a review, it's great. Next slide, please. And then I do have a clip from this one, um, Arun Jacobs um, talking about social annotation and then um, you'll see what happens at the end of his speaking. And I, I liked this clip because it really, it pulls in the idea of community like in real time. So I'll kind of let the clip speak for itself. All right, you don't want to set it up. <laughs> well, I mean, I was kind of setting it up. I mean, just to say that it's he, he, what he's talking about is, um, you know, looking at reading as something much broader and all encompassing. So I'm not just annotating in the margins with like, I disagree with this, or I, I don't disagree with this, but like opening it up for people to be creative in their annotations. Okay, well, let's give a listen to Arun way I might think that through is it's it's not just reading the text it's like uh, how our social cultural reading practices look like right now we don't just watch a tv show you gotta you know have the build up to the tv show and then you gotta go find out what was spoken about it and so in that way we don't just consume text in isolation anymore it's the recognition as educators that these texts come with paratexts that the reader is consuming. So, the, so annotations are a way, social annotations are a way to recognize that and to fold that in to teaching praxis, which was happening in other spaces anyway. And if that is incorporated into it, that could change, you know, the way that teachers are thinking about reading. It's like if, if every bit of, of literature that you assign comes with other, te I mean, fan texts that are associated with it, then let's let's fold that in. And, it, and in annotations, it's like, oh, these students are going to generate X number of words along with this as well, and account for that and, and count that as reading material as well. I love that idea of thinking about like bringing all of that into the classroom. That's where you wanted it to end, Franny? Well, actually, no, there's a bit more. Oh, okay. Couldn't tell because it moved away from him. Let me steal that back. The whole, the whole world has become one giant book club in a sense, right? Okay. You wanted to yeah. get my, my last word in there. Okay. 
yeah so it was kind of um i didn't want to spoil it but i just i love that it's a, like a little you know um Haley says oh i'm gonna steal that and then nate sees he makes his own kind of um cognitive leap there to the whole world is one giant book club um and so it just sort of shows like the power of that collaborative thinking in real time but um but yeah also like what we it go, kind of goes back to that question of like what we're bringing to the text and i like that arun is um in his teaching is celebrating that and also um making that uh, he's enabling that for students yeah and i think i mean i i think there was a sort of meta happening there that, that you're calling out right it's like the conversation that we all were having in that episode was an example of people thinking together about something right. that um, illustrated how social annotation can also be a conversation of people together thinking about something, in that case, a text, right? Right. So we're all well, thinking together. I mean, it's, it's one big brain, right? It's, it's, it's a board. It's cyborg. It's so board. <laughs> it's a meta all the way down, as Alex said in the chat. Uh, if you can hear my cat in the background, sorry for that. We can. Hi, William. It is William. Um, and then um, this is uh, this is my second to last clip. I'm, I'm going to try to go quickly here because we're going to run out of time. But um, this is Marites um, Apigo, and she's um, what I liked about this clip is, and it's a little bit longer, but bear with it because there are so many great takeaways in it. So she's really focused on sort of. Um, practical things that you can do with annotation and in particular at the community college level um, and you know community college um, colleges um, typically have you know just a really broad spectrum of students of all ages and all income levels and um, and um, you know race creed and color and everything so uh, it's it's a great episode just in that sense so it's like it's almost like annotation for um the non-traditional college student let's just say not exclusively but i'll shut up now and play the clip <laughs> one of the things that we do at the very beginning is um i introduce to them six reading comprehension strategies um and they are uh making connections so you know i ask students to um as they read, make connections to it. And that could be connecting <clears throat> what they read to their lives. It can be connecting um, it to other books or articles or movies or songs, events. So, you know, as you're reading, think of like what this reminds you of. Um, another strategy is to visualize. So um, I ask students to, you know, create pictures in your mind when you read. Um, you can picture, you know, as you're reading, what can you visualize? Um, or what's the, the movie that's playing in your head as you're reading? Um, another strategy is to ask questions, because good readers ask questions uh, before, during, after their, <clears throat> their reading so that they can get a better understanding. Um, <clears throat> some more strategies are to infer. So really teaching students, like, how do you read between the lines? How you draw conclusions uh, based on what you're reading? Um, there's another one on determining importance. So uh, teaching students how to um, pull out the big ideas, um, especially when students are asked to summarize something that they read, they're, ha they're having to determine, well, what's important? How can I uh, sift out all of the unnecessary um, details? Um, and then synthesize. So how do you use what you've read to start creating your own ideas? Um, and form new ideas and interpretations. So those are like the six reading comprehension strategies that um, I teach my students at the beginning. And um, I've been using the reading apprentice apprenticeship framework for about two decades now. <laughs> it's been a really fundamental part of my, my pedagogy um, when teaching reading and writing. And um, I started using this um, when I was teaching high school um, and I'm still using it um, when I transferred over to the California Community College system. And um, I can drop in the chat a link to the um, a link to the um, reading apprenticeship information in case anyone's interested by West Ed. Um, 
you know, they're incorporating four dimensions of reading, social, personal, cognitive, and knowledge building. And it's really about getting students to have a metacognitive conversation about what they read. So to actually make their thinking, be aware of their thinking. So one of the things I do when I teach these six reading comprehension strategies is I kind of fuse in the reading apprenticeship framework into that. And I first a model for my students how I read. And so I'll do a think aloud where, um, you know, I'll, I'll read a piece and then I'll stop and actually, um, you know, vocalize my thinking out loud so that they can hear what's going on in my brain. So they can hear me ask the questions. They can hear me visualizing. They can hear me synthesizing um, out loud. So when I do that modeling and thinking aloud, um, I'm <laughs> then wanting them to start incorporating those strategies into their own reading when they when they do it on their own. So um, I've used hypothesis to practice these uh, reading strategies. And, um, you know, I asked the students to tag their strategies that they're using as they're putting them into the margins, you know, tag when you're asking a question, tag when you're synthesizing. And, um, you know, also for ESL students, you know, we incorporate some kind of vocabulary building in there too, so that um, stu uh, students as they're reading, they're identifying any unknown words to them. So since um, all of our, you know, readings connect to what they're going to then be writing about, um, I encourage my students to also make little private annotations to themselves as they come across any possible quotes that they may want to cite later on in their writing. And so um, they can always go back when it's time to, to write the essay and already have kind of some pre-selected quotes. That Oops, did that cut off, Fanny? I think it kind of cut off, but I, I, it's a very long clip. So, I mean, we, we sort of got the gist that those are the important parts that okay. you know, I'm going to highlight there. Um, <clears throat> great. Yeah, she she really goes into some depth about my, the, the details of her, her actual practice, which is great. Yeah, and some of it is informed by the fact that um, she does have ESL students. And so and I thought that was interesting, but also like the you know, identifying words that you don't understand could be also for non-ESL students. I mean, um, so. Sure, and there's that particular episode, if I remember correctly, focuses in on a, a particular case in California where there's legislation now that says that um, it's no longer okay for community colleges to, you know, end up with students who are stuck in a sort of cul-de-sac of developmental learning where they're trying to develop college level skills and instead um, ask colleges to fast track people into normal college study um, and give them the support that they need to get there in ways that that don't sort of, you know, put them in this separate category. And these people talk about how they use social annotation to help make that possible, really powerful stuff. Yeah, very interesting. Um, we are gonna we are running up against the clock, but let's I say we keep going because we still have some stuff to cover. And if anybody needs to leave, um, including Michael, um, you know, thank you for being here. Um, hopefully you can just hang out for another 10 minutes while we whip through this. But if you can't, um, this re recording will be available uh, probably next week. So. Okay, so then um, we traveled up to Canada. You can see how cold it is up there by Fergal guest Fergal O'Hagan's uh, photo. Um, this is a really, really good episode too. Um, and uh, I, I just think that like, it's, it's interesting how it is being used up in Canada, but it's not so much about Canada, but just like, it, it, this could be any episode anywhere, um, but there's a lot of really interesting stuff um, um, uh, that Olga, especially Andrew Trius, Trievsky, I'm, I know I just butchered that, but um, that she talks about about history. So anyone interested in um, history and Soviet history um, in particular will want to definitely catch this episode. It's almost like Canadians are humans too, right, Alex? We have a Canadian in the audience, so. Oh my God, Nate. <laughs> oh, it's just funny. It's, it's funny. That but you can't take them anymore. Oh. The, the practices in Canada, would they be so different really? I mean. 
that's what I was saying. They're not right. not really, but yeah. but we you know we love the idea that that social annotation is you know s- spreading out um, around the world, and it, and in fact it is already around the world. And we have other episodes like the one with Maha Bali, which you know she's in Cairo um, and using it there. And then we we also have um, we haven't done it yet, but we're going to do at some point um, all in Spanish liquid margins, focusing on um, uh, Rosario uh, wrote. Rogel, Rogel, um, Rosario Rogel, yeah, mm-hmm. Rogel, and and how she's using it in um in Mexico City. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, um, and I was just going to say too, there's a really great episode on um on uh the use of social annotation in Armenia from one of the I annotate episodes. Um, so it really has spread around the globe in really interesting ways. Yeah. Okay, and then this episode, and you might have noticed um, previously that we did have an episode on annotating um, science. Um, this is more focused on, um, you know, annotating um, scientific primary sources um, in science, um, and it's also just fantastic. Um, and I think that, and I just want to say, like in general, this is a really good time to be annotating science and history, right? I mean because there's so much sort of misinformation, but just, this is more- There's so much history going on right now. Yeah, we're in history right now. Yeah, um, there's more history than ever before, I think. We're so in history. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, check this one out. It's because it's especially interesting um, in the sciences, but also can be applied to any other discipline. So just good practices in there. Next slide, please. I love saying that. Okay. Um, <laughs> And then um, this, of course, uh, you know, as the um, pandemic ramps up again, um, we don't need to go to the dark side here and talk about that. But, you know, gosh, um, every day I hear about schools going back to full remote. um, And I'm sure there's going to be some hybrid there as well. Um, But this is like how you can use social annotation anytime, whether you're online or on campus, as the title says. Um, And you know, there may be differences in the way you use it in the class when you have everyone in the classroom. Um, but, um, you know, that's up to you. I mean, it just, this one just sort of shows how flexible social annotation is as a pedagogical practice. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. I think because so many people in the flip to remote learning for the pandemic kind of glommed onto social annotation as a tool for that, it, it sort of um, overwrote the fact that, as many of these teachers talk about, social annotation is a valuable tool regardless of the circumstances. It's not just a tool to use during remote learning for the pandemic. It's a tool that can, you know, that can bring those powerful pedagogical, you know, affordances to any kind of experience. So, really great stuff. And then um, literacy and learning with social annotation in high school. Um, you know, again, how, I, I mean, I think that people should be starting to annotate in grade school, but, um, and maybe they will at some point, you know, um, but this is just really interesting about how um, and Morgan Jackson and Joe Dillon are just such thoughtful educators and um, really brilliant and, and warm and kind and, um, and just in the way that they talk about social annotation in this episode as it relates to their students learning. Um, it's really inspiring. Yeah, and to connect that back to what Matt Salamone was saying about, you know, how uh, people's anxiety around math starts to build up almost from day one in school, right? Um, you know, school is actually like a factory that helps us uh, build up anxiety about math or reading in English, right? And so to have to have these practices um, go back in time into earlier parts of people's, you know, school experiences to help them you know, realize that, yes, everything is social. Everything is a conversation. I just it can't happen early enough in my book. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, um, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not enabling you to say, uh, no, next okay. slide, please. Should I go back? Yeah, I'm going to go back and then you can say it. Next slide, please. It's like when you're a little kid and you get to press the elevator buttons. Um, but in this case, I don't have to press the button. So um, I just you command the buttons with your voice. 
I just give the orders. Yeah. Um, yeah. But successfully implementing social annotation at your school, you know, again, and these are all, um, you know, uh, uh, folks who are involved in instructional design um, in some capacity. And so it's really great to hear from them in this episode too, because they, um, you know, they've sort of got their finger on the pulse of, you know, how best to do this, how this works. And they're really invested in um, not just social annotation, but other um, powerful ways um, to use ed tech. Um, not that they talked about it in here, but I mean, you know, I just think it's it's a very important thing now to recognize that ed tech is part of the learning experience um, and there's good and bad ed tech, obviously, um, but, and just how social annotation fits into that. I messed the slides again before I was ordered. Dang it. I keep trying to anticipate you, but. Please advance the slides, Mr. Angel. <laughs> yes, Ms. French. Um, and again, and this might seem like redundant um, because we just talked about how you can use social annotation in different um, configurations of classrooms. Um, but I would say that this one really really delves into that and it's also guest moderated. Um, we've got a few that are guest moderated, but um, Janae Cohn um, guest moderates this one. And she, again, she's just one of these very thoughtful educators um, and um, is, is super invested in what she's doing. And David Cerna, the other guest, is uh, extremely you know well-versed in how to use um, social annotation in whatever kind of classroom you're in. So um, again, because we are moving into this, you know, COVID feels like 100.0, um, you know, it's worth sort of looking at these episodes in particular that do have to do with using social annotation in different settings. Um, and great for anyone who hasn't used social annotation yet. So, yeah. yeah so Janae, is, Janae is, has some great things to say here. She wrote this fantastic book on, on uh, reading strategies uh, as well. And so she really brings some of that perspective to the conversation there. Yeah, next slide, please. <laughs> and then uh, this one is, is mostly focused on student writing, but not exclusively. So um, just like that clip that I picked from Cindy Garcia earlier, um, where she's connecting reading and writing. Um, this is a great one for that. And um, again, fantastic guests. Like, I, I can't say enough, like how lucky we've been to have such great guests. And we're not paying anyone to come on this show. You know, it's completely volunteer. So if anybody thinks you're gonna get rich um, when we ask you to come on to Liquid Margins, <laughs> no. But you will get a gift in the mail, a thank you gift, so. It's, uh, yeah, and I think this is another theme that really came through in a lot of episodes is this idea that, you know, we think of annotation as being a, a practice around reading, but it's so often a practice around writing as well. Um, a lot of people really speak to that, how um, helping people learn how to read differently can really can empower their writing as well. Yeah, and I think it just speaks to kind of what we were talking about earlier, too, about, um, you know, reading is as much a conversation as writing is. And so if you're going to be a good writer, you have to jump into that conversation of other texts to get to get your foundation and to also, you know, to be in the conversation. Yeah, and you're, as a writer, you're at least in a conversation with your imagined reader, right? <laughs> so it's already conversational. Oop, oh, dang it. I keep waiting. Next slide, please. <laughs> there we go. We'll get it right by the end. We've got one more slide to go before I... Uh, I, I, after I pulled my clips of which I have one more after this, um, I, I was like, dang it, you know, I really wanted to pick a clip from this, but it, I just couldn't make it work. Um, this is actually one of my all-time favorite episodes of Liquid Margins. Um, now you're getting choked up. Yeah, I know. I was just going to say, you know, Nate the big crier. I'm like, I, I can cry. Uh, I think I did cry during this one a couple of times. Um, and it's, you know, it's about, you know, basically, you know, teaching nurses um, 
how to do what they do through social annotation. And it also touches on that, like, you know, reaching them in um, remote ways, you know. Uh, but there's just such beauty in this one in terms of how, um, how much they care about their students. And, and I know everybody who teaches cares about their students um, or, you know, probably almost everybody. But in this okay. one, that just, yeah. But that just really comes through. And then also they have stories about, you know, what different students did in response to those annotations and how community truly was built um, in the classrooms that where they taught with social yep. annotations. And if I remember correctly, I didn't I didn't rewatch this one just recently, but um this is another example, like the math one, maybe where people are like nursing annotation like what why would you use annotation in a nursing course and these folks really illustrate why it why it was so powerful next slide please <laughs> see how i waited there and then this is going to be my last clip um this was a show that i said during the show this was a long time in the making um because you know um OER is so important to what we do as an organization and how we think and it fits in with our philosophy and um, and with our, you know, with our social annotation tool. Um, so I'm really proud of this one. And um, it was this was guest moderated by the great Robin DeRosa. And I hope she's watching this so she hears that, but um, uh, it, 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 again, it's chock full of really great stuff, but the clip I picked, um, I picked because it really um, makes this connection, it, it's almost like blurs the line between social annotation and OER um, in a way that just is great. So, um, Nate, if you would press the play button on that. And just for anybody who doesn't know, OER stands obviously for Open Educational Resources for people who aren't familiar with the lingo. The first OER I ever made or used was an OER that I created with students um, called the Open Anthology of Early American Literature. I was really lucky to be in a field where almost everything was public domain texts. So we made this anthology it was digital um, and it was kind of okay. You know, it didn't have a lot of things that the paid version had in terms of like footnotes and notes. And so students weren't actually loving it. And that kind of changed when I layered in hypothesis to this open textbook that we had made. Um, and I put in the chat uh, uh, the sort of origin stories of this of this project and you can you can take a look at it a little but hypothesis was new when I was doing this um, and somehow you know they were so new and so small that they would like talk to me every day about like how's it going over in your class and they would watch um, they would watch my class like do a kind of beta thing so it was this really cool thing because I was not a techie so um, I really felt like they were watching actual students to develop the tool, which was cool. And then my students love the idea of like being in on the ground floor of something. But the textbook itself really took off when I put hypothesis in there. Um, and you can see from the little write up I shared that I think hypothesis was the reason that this OER became a living organic place rather than um, a replacement for a textbook. It was replacing the Heath Anthology. And that was kind of a game changer for me. So in some ways, I think hypothesis is what pulled me into open pedagogy. This idea that using open resources allowed for my students to have a different relationship to learning materials than they had before. Um, so that was like pretty transformative for me. And again, at the time I was new and open, I was new in everything. Um, so I was just, I felt really lucky to be hooked in with a community of people that was discovering the potential of using an open license, making OER, using social annotation, all as kind of one posse. And I, I think it's hard for me to separate out now the OER from 
the social annotations. So all the stuff I've done since, mostly through Rebus, um, has had hypothesis, you know, plugged into it. And I think it's been. Uh oh. Did yeah, that cut? cut off a little bit, but. Should I uh, keep it going or? Um, if you if you want, I think people probably got the gist of that. Um, I think it's just, yeah, it's fantastic how she, like I said, she doesn't see any separation between OER and social annotation, which I think is, is so interesting. And I, I kind of want to hear a little bit more about that. So, I mean, we've, like I said, this was a long time in the making, but I think it would be great for us to do another episode um, with social annotation and OER, maybe with different people. Um, just to get different perspectives, but yeah, it's a really great one. And in case anyone's wondering too, that one of the things I love about it is that the thing on the wall behind Robin is, is uh, I think her husband is an artist and he made that sculpture and it's an ice cube tray, like an old fashioned kind of ice cube tray. Huh. I didn't so, really, I didn't even notice that. Point. Totally <laughs> decided to point, but I like, every time I watch that, I love that bit, but. Um, yeah, well, I, as Alex was saying in the chat too, um, you know, there's such a deep connection. And as you mentioned, Franny, there's such a deep connection between open educational resources and open education in general and social annotation. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that in my experience, having worked in that field quite a bit, there's a real, there's an intersection between the kinds of educators who are interested in and practicing open education and, and those who are interested in tools like social annotation and uh, you know going beyond that kind of ed tech solutionism that alex mentioned in the chat um they're using social annotation in ways that really you know empower students and the and those learning communities as opposed to just kind of throwing a tool into the mix in, with the idea that it's going to just vastly improve learning because there's a new tool in the mix right yeah and i also just want to say and i you know um in her clip, she talks about how hypothesis sort of, um, you know, was listening in on the class. I just want to make it clear we don't do that as a regular practice. <laughs> like, we're not into surveillance. That totally goes against like our, you know, our ethos. But, um, but she, you know, that seemed like kind of a neat thing, and I like the idea that the students enjoyed that too because they knew that they were trying something new. And, and just the fact that like, it really enlivened the, the process for them. Like, you know, they, they weren't enjoying it. And then with the advent of this, they were. So that also just, you know, it, it, involved, it, it gets students involved in their own learning and it gives them agency, I think, to be able to socially annotate what they're reading. And, you know, it, it all kind of ties back to what we talked about earlier in this show um, there is nobody who does some genius thing in a vacuum. I mean, I don't even like the idea of genius. I, I think it's, you know, I think we need to go back and examine who, who did we call a genius and why did we call them that? And what did we think that they were doing? They weren't just tabula rasa, you know, coming up with an idea. That's not how it works. So um, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Yeah, and I think so much of what we're doing is undoing those old beliefs, right? And this is a perfect time in many ways in life to be like deconstructing these old beliefs and saying, huh, well, what, what actually is this? You know, what is history? What is science? What is English literature? What's the canon? Who's a genius? You know, it's a very interesting time. There's so much history going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> to come back. There's more history than ever before. Crazy. <laughs> history in multiple universes as well, right? Not to mention the metaverse. Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, this has yeah, been, I just yeah. have to say what a valuable experience it was just to go back and revisit all the episodes. I want to, I want to give a big thanks to Franny, who's really been the, she's acts as the producer, she is the producer behind Liquid Margins that makes it all happen. And whoa, it's a lot of work actually, but wow, what great fruit comes from the seeds that you planted, if I may carry the metaphor too far. Um, 
at any rate, thank you so much for, for have all the good work that you put into this. And I mean, now we, you know, this it's, we'll be coming up on our second anniversary, you know, in the spring, I guess. And, uh, it's just been so powerful yeah. and amazing. Uh, what a rich trove of material that, um, as Ramey once suggested that somebody, somebody needs to do some scholarly work de delving into the material that's collected in these episodes and, and really bringing out, um, in a more scientific <laughs> or in a more thorough way than we managed to do in this show, you know, what the, yeah. what the big themes and takeaways are. Yeah. And it's just nice to see too, what started with an idea, you know, we're brainstorming on zoom from our board you know, hedge classes, and we were trying to come up with a name and everything. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's just really nice to see it come to fruition and to see, um, you know, and to get these great guests that honestly, I mean, I'm so humbled by, you know, and they're excited to come on the show. It's not like, I'm like, okay, I guess I'll go on the show. I mean, they're really excited about it. And, um, and nor do we ask them to, you know, specifically even mention hypothesis. It's really a show about social annotation. It's not a show just promoting hypothesis, but then half the time they're really promoting hypothesis and saying yeah. how great we are. So it's like, okay. It makes me feel a little uncomfortable sometimes because they're so. I know. I sometimes kind of feel comfortable by it. And I'm like, well, you, know, you don't need to do that. You know? Yeah. Or, I mean, it is yeah. really awesome, but yeah, I know. It's funny. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you've been with us for over an hour now, at least uh, those, those folks who took some time out from their holiday schedule to be here. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, I guess we should probably bring it to a close and uh, put this one to bed so it can be edited and shared out with the world. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. And um, again, there'll be a recording of this. Um, hopefully next week, we'll let you know. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful solstice and um, we'll just see you in the new year with some new Liquid Margin shows. Yes, and remember, uh, the days will be getting longer from now on, so uh, once the solstice passes. So that's, yeah. that's positive, right? That'll be good. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. We, we appreciate your congratulations. And you may have the award for the person who's been to the most episodes yourself. So we appreciate it. Yeah, that. thank you, Alex. <laughs> thanks, Nate. And thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone in the chat. <laughs>